Hello, everybody. Welcome to the final episode of the Sofa Series Artist Spotlight. And there's no better way to close it out than with Coloratura Soprano, Haley Fuquin. How are Hello. you? <laughs> you know. You know. <laughs> Trying to uh, get through day by day and, you know find out what's what's next or yeah or like not or not top, not. <laughs> holding pattern indefinitely <laughs> uh, so Haley darling so walk us through a little bit of uh, where you're from your uh, how did you come to Boston and uh, what are you up to these days Sure. Um, I'm originally from Northern Idaho in a small town um, called Sam Point. And I moved out to Boston uh, to attend Boston Conservatory, where I'm at the lovely Leslie. And, um, and I got my start playing piano at a very young age and had um, an uncle who is um, dearly departed, but would encourage me to listen to all of these CDs and cassettes, remember those? <laughs> uh, of various opera singers. And at first I was so annoyed by it. And then at a certain point he had been sending enough that it kind of just seeped in and I was, and I was just charmed and taken away by it. And so started taking voice lessons and decided to get the hell out of Idaho and see what the rest of the world Good had. Call. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I moved out to Boston in 2006. I did my vocal performance degree at Boston Conservatory and um, took a year off in between that and my graduate degree, which I received from Boston University in historical performance. Um, and I, you know, at the end of my undergrad degree, I've been interested in the music of Bach and this aspect of performance practice and authenticity and what what all of that means and wanted to explore it um, through the lens of a performance degree that was a little more um, academic, shall we say. Yeah. And then I've just been hanging out in Boston ever since and uh, live in Cambridge with my partner, Patrick. It's a, it's a good town. I gotta say, I miss a lot about Boston. I don't, I don't miss the cold and uh, the <laughs> yeah. dreary. Uh, hence, why California called. <laughs> right. I answered. <laughs> uh, so, talk a little bit about, um, like, how did you? So, you know, I was there at the Boston Conservatory, and there, there, there wasn't a whole lot of early music being. Uh, being performed at the Boco, it was very much, you know main stage opera career path mm -hmm. um and so how did you i mean how did how did these musics kind of like seep in into you um and uh yeah like when when did that start to kind of like start yeah. <laughs> Haley, <Bach. laughs> uh, i think it all started i was taking a choral repertoire class with Miguel Felipe, um, who was such a, a light and a great supporter of mine at the conservatory. Um, yeah, he, let's like take a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Miguel Felipe freaking rules. He is like the loveliest, kindest, like most, like he was just this effervescent, not was, he's alive. What am I talking about? But like, <laughs> but like he's no longer at the Boston Conservatory. So, and neither are we. So, <laughs> but like, let's like take a second to praise, sing the praises loud and proud for Miguel Felipe, who is divine. He's so yeah. great. He's so great. So anyway, yeah, he's so wonderful. He, he, um, <laughs> You know, we had this, this course was actually a two year long course that we, um, you know, he said, for those of you who are interested, if you want to do this, we'll do it. It will take two years to get through. Um, 
and it just really opened my eyes to other music that was out there in terms of um, apart from mainstream opera and again oratorio and other sacred music and um, and secular choral music mm -hmm. not that far away from you know the highway of opera no <laughs> exactly like these musics are not islands you know they, they they sort of enmesh and are intertwined and it's not it's not like so ridiculous that anybody would do anything other than opera but sometimes but say that to some opera singers and you're like why would you do anything else <laughs> <laughs> there is only one <laughs> um, yeah, I think I was really drawn to um, the, you know, I think also in terms of just the way oratorios and sacred works are presented, that it's, um, you're not spending six weeks staging and doing all these rehearsals. There's such a wonderful synergy that happens in kind of the week that you put together these works. Um, and I really love that in terms of a way to get through more music and perform more music. And, um, and so we focused a lot on Bach and Handel and other composers of the Baroque and classical era. And, um, and so from that, I took um, and programmed a Bach cantata on my senior recital. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I was the first person in several years yeah. to get this harpsichord out. The <laughs> conservatory has a harpsichord. Oh. And they demanded that they get it out. And oh. I used it on my recital um, and did the cantata with a uh, continuo violin and. Um, and oboe obligato, yeah. so violin and oboe obligato players. And, um, and I just really loved starting to dig into why do we perform the things we do and what were they like during that time and how are they different? And then also just kind of how, um, how the different movements of resurrecting these works has changed how we think about them and see them over mm -hmm. time. And, um, and it really can, you know, even though it's all about music from the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, it's really only in the last hundred years that we've really rediscovered it. And there have been several movements within that for how it was performed and and I think that that is um, something that is alive and vital and is um, newer ways to look at that music. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of, it's funny because a lot of people who do early music do new music. It's kind of like, yeah. you, you pick the, you go this way or you're like, here, there. let's do, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, there's so much interplay. There's so much there's so much that is like incredibly similar to the approaches of, of both musics and in my in my pursuit of contemporary music, it has taken me to Bach, you know? That like it wasn't through it wasn't through opera, it wasn't through any of that. It was it was through studying studying the the dorks of my time, you know. <laughs> yeah. They're like, but actually Bach is great. And it's like, oh, yeah, you're right. right. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty rad. Um, so like, yeah, you're saying that like, um, like um, early musicology or like musicology really is, is a relatively new um, uh, practice, um, like the actual academic study of music histories and um and all of the like socio-political everythings that go into into what creates a movement in music. So how um, I guess yeah, you're saying that like that the way that people look at um, older musics is starting to to shift. How are how is that shifting? Yeah, I think I think it shifts in the way that um, you know there was a movement around say like the '60s and '70s when early music, that's really when musicology around um, music of 
the Baroque period and earlier and later, but generally on the Baroque period, mm -hmm. that there was this um, focus on what sort of rooms were they performed in mm -hmm. and what sort of voices might they have been and what, um, what did, you know, we have no recordings, so we don't know right. what it sounds like. Um, and who, you know, who was singing them and what type of voice were they and how much vibrato would they use and what, um, and just how they would present themselves. I mean, we have the whole problematic category of Castrati, which we don't have to get into. Um, Lord. But, <laughs> but it kind of became the style that early music was this very like, delicate, um, precious thing and, you know, sung by, you know, small voices with, you know, wearing moomoos. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> monks and, and nuns, monks and nuns. <laughs> right. <That's it. laughs> and the thing is, it's like the thinking of people who were singing it and performing it at the time and certainly singing Baroque opera, they were rock stars. I mean, they were bigger, they were the biggest celebrities. Yeah. And the voices, you know, the voices were not just small, you know, and again, yeah. it's the, the castrati, you know, that is a whole, a whole different can of worms, but you, just even in the case of the women who were, cast they had to not compete but they had to be able to stand up there with these um male voices yeah. that were hugely powerful and so this notion and, and sort of like superhuman be, you know because <laughs> because of the castration like there's this yeah. i don't think um people quite realize that like that so castrati like the whole practice of castrati is morally reprehensible um and it is abusive and it is the worst but what it did to the body these bodies is like in a way very fascinating because their rib cages like were massive but their heads were not right so, like <laughs> They had all this like wind capacity, yeah. but like their heads quite didn't didn't quite grow because right. of, like the hormonal yeah. um, the hormonal cocktail in there was just not normalized ever, but their their chests did, and so like they had like so much air and they were freaking loud, <laughs> you know, powerful and yeah. you know, I think um, and that's kind of the part that that I you know, I really love about how we can look at early music and how we can perform it, that um, it's, it doesn't have to be this precious, delicate thing. It's, you know, it can be loud and body and mm. um, so fierce and so um, emotional that, mm -hmm. you know, while there is, I think, the such great beauty in, um, works you know especially a lot of Bach cantatas and things like that that are um you know to a listener who might not understand where you know the history of where it's coming from or the text or this and that that it it can seem a little more quote-unquote boring in terms of what what follows in music history and mm -hmm. then how the mold has been broken over time but um you know, there's there's a reason so many people and composers always return to Bach. Yeah, and, and his influence and um, and so yeah, I think you know, there's just even though the music is three four hundred years old, there's always something new to discover. There's also just the piece of so much of this was not documented in terms of parts lost and, you know, even fa very famous works in the modern canon that we don't even have full complete parts and sets for some of these pieces mm -hmm. and that those are still trying to be reconstructed or um, discovered or 
you know, looking through church and state archives to see what can be found. And, yeah. you know, and I think that's, that's really fascinating. Um, yeah, the library attic dwellers, you know, those, those musicologists that just sit right. in attics for, for years on some grant <laughs> and right. maybe find like a line of something that's right. missing. <laughs> Yeah, but it's important. It is important. It <laughs> is. They're doing the Lord's work. <laughs> uh, but I think that, like, um, I think so. What you're saying um, about about early music, or just sort of like pre, let's say pre Mozart, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and even into into Mozart, it's, there's this in our music history classes where we are. It is taught like since birth that like okay, now expressivity begins with Beethoven. You know. <laughs> This whole nonsense of Sturm und Drang suddenly being a thing. It's like, I don't know. Have you listened to <laughs> Bach? Like, it is raucous and wild and, like, really, like, fiercely passionate and, um, and, like, devastatingly still. There, there is, like, all that Sturm and all that Drang, you know? It is <laughs> at play and in conflict and in communication and, and it's just, it's so alive. It's, and, and, but I think a lot of that sort of liveliness comes from a lot of the, a lot of agency given to the performers too. Yeah. Right. So that like, that you can, you get to kind of fill in a lot of blanks. You're given a roadmap, but there's lots of freedom there. Uh, how did you, how did you, or how do you approach that kind of um, improvisation and, and ornaments? And is there, are there strict rules or, or can you, are you kind of free to do whatever the hell you want? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, there are, so you can be a little classy, you can be a little trashy and kind of, you know. <laughs> Uh, and knowing you, <laughs> you err on the ladder. <laughs> um, no, you're a classy dame. <laughs> come on. Come on. <laughs> um, you know, there are certain uh, rubrics and schools based on the music that you're performing and the when it was composed, the country of the composer, mm -hmm. um, say something that is a more French ornament versus what would be considered more Italianate, which, you know, we don't have to get into that. You can go <laughs> and agree in historical performance if you want. Yeah, and I'm sure there's <laughs> lots of disagreements in that anyway, is, you know. There is too, and it's kind of about um, taking what, um, what the text demands most of all mm -hmm. in terms of what, um, you know, especially with Baroque pieces too, text is often repeated multiple times and you use the ornaments to express a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, that the ornaments are how you're able to change up and express something differently. Um, you know, so starting from the text at the base of it, but then what, what is the emotion? What are you trying to convey? Are you trying to persuade, cajole, what, you know, whatever that might be. And then, um, and then I think the ornaments can also reflect some of that in terms of, is it more an outcry or is it you're trying to be sexy and you're trying to seduce? And, um, and I think all of those various means to an end can be found in, in ornaments. Um, yeah, but I love that like the sort of the the entire spectrum of human emotion can exist in a single in a single Baroque aria. That like when you're going from the A section to the B section, there's like this interplay of like outward expressivity versus inward like introspection, mm -hmm. and then you can kind of dive into and explore what what decisions are being made in in the the character in the you know and then and then change it when you return to the A right. That's just like oh, yeah. it's quite the journey. <laughs> I mean, it's a huge journey, and you know, and a lot of people are like, "Oh, I don't like to listen to Baroque opera, and this and this it's boring." And and to that, I say, you have not been watching or listening to yeah. the right Baroque opera because you can be completely transported. And if anything, the stories are wackier mm -hmm. than those that follow in the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in terms of 
lovers and royalty and you know what sort of sea creatures and mer people <laughs> and other random um non-human yeah. folks shall we need we more sea creatures in Opera. <laughs> right. like more sea creatures <laughs> I mean Wagner sort of did it but then he yeah. left the Rhine maidens behind almost immediately you know right. <laughs> like come on they're the most interesting Thank part <laughs> Enjoy. yeah yeah <laughs> <Nah. laughs> well right and also like the 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 politics of the politics of operas um right so who who is writing and for which audience is i think really really fascinating and remains fascinating like to this day like who who are these operas for first of all mm -hmm. and is the um at this at these times are our composers making some sort of a, uh like a statement against or in support of a political movement which is dangerous and pretty bold right. you know that like the the decision to set a lot of like uh political characters and like uh -huh. actual historical um historical stories but maybe not actually casting a good light on certain <laughs> you know i think it's, it's brave right it's it's super brave but i think it's also again in that kind of parallel between early music and say music of the 20th and 21st centuries, I think, you know, we saw in the 18th and 19th century, less of these stories being told and composed through a political lens in the same way. A lot right. of it was about these love stories or legends or this and that that people wanted to see that were in you know were enjoyable and that were money makers and became very popular mm -hmm. and and i really think that we see on the outskirts of those two centuries works being made for with a political bent and um and you know for specific audiences or trying to um, get some sort of view across or um, and again also in you know in service of their patrons too I, you know we see a lot of that um, and I think it's it's really fascinating to go back and look at why these pieces were written where they were premiered and when and who was paying for them and um yeah like any anybody who's like disseminating any sort of in information right follow the money like who's who's actually sponsoring this who is this who is this serving mm -hmm. um and then which i think makes makes even um like a composer to decide to maybe not be so so supportive or so like favorable uh in their depictions of certain peoples i think that's even more like like all right fuck the system you know <laughs> do it <laughs> yeah i think you know there are there are examples of more overt um applications of this and also just those that might say be more subversive and mm -hmm. if you knew you knew um and i think that happens a lot but then I think also in um, in knowing that opera was much more for the masses and was, you know, that people were of all economic classes and education levels were enjoying it, that, mm. um, that there are so many layers within that in terms of what pieces you might pick up on, which were parallels to government officials or the monarchy at the time or this and that. And, um, you know, I, I hope that someday we will be able to return to that. Or, you know, I think we've made great strides in the past 10, 20 years trying to, um, get there, but it's, it's certainly still, um, not at all something that is yeah. presented yeah. to the masses in the same way that it was even, 50, 75, 100 years ago. Right. And my, my, that's sort of my big kind of like hope and optimism out of, out of not only just the pandemic, but, but the ongoing, uh, justified protests that are, um, that are happening as we speak, 
um, is that the classical music world has a lot of soul searching to do, right? That it is sort of built on privilege and um, those who have access to this kind of education or this kind of, per even this kind of performance, it is, it is largely exclusive. Um, and so I think, I think that the smaller, the smaller companies uh, like have taken the note and are, are doing are doing the good work but I think the larger organizations um, have some have some serious thinking to do you know they need to go yeah. to their rooms and, and think about what they've done <laughs> and perpetuate it for centuries it is it is dis absurd that in in an entire season of, of like a symphony that you'll have 10 uh, 10 Beethovens and maybe one woman or maybe right. maybe one person of color uh probably both in one you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah so my my big hope is that is that all all organizations are starting to think about about their place in the political scheme of things we're not just out there for escapism it can't be that it can't right. be that what's, no, I, what's I the think point that, of that right <laughs> And yeah. I think that's exactly true that the, you know, I, opera is racist. It has been for a long time. Yeah. I think there are, there are better works than others, but um, on the whole, it's, um, that is where it has been, unfortunately, for yeah. as long as it's been around. Yeah. Um, and I, and I agree that I think the work that needs to be done and what we can do to be more inclusive and to be telling stories from people other than just white, well-educated, um, well-to-do people, it, the work needs to be done. And, and I think it really will come from these smaller and medium-sized companies who aren't relying on a pool of donors who are you know probably 10 to 20 years from the grave um, <laughs> she calls it like she sees them <laughs> <laughs> but yes <laughs> that is the fact facts are facts um, you know i think i think it starts from music education and that being cut from schools and just public education private education that that is so so important and you know i think we continue to see that it is just as vital and just as important as anything else in the stem ecosystem and you know i know that they use steam as the um, acronym right a lot now but i think um but i really do hope that the companies that want to stick around and be meaningful and valuable over the next year, decade, hundred years, um, will really look inside and see what they're doing in terms of number one, the the artists that they hire, mm -hmm. the works that they program, and not just oh well, here's our fringe concert. <laughs> where we that's where we put our that's where we get to slum it with all of the the edgy stories right? about not white people <laughs> right or like oh the piece by a living composer that goes on our <laughs> yeah <laughs> over here and you know so it starts with the artists you hire the works that you're presenting the your staff and your boards and i think there's there's a long way to go in terms of the artists that are hired and the works that are presented, mm -hmm. especially since I think the exposure that people have had to works like that are, are few it's and far between. Yeah, abysmal, yeah. But, um, but your, the boards and the staffs of these organizations, that I think is the first step you should take and, um, you know, again, all of these are incredibly important and vital work to be done, but I think that we have to really think about the nonprofit arts world and how that needs to change. Because as we've seen through this pandemic and now through these protests that 
the structures of American life, of just wealth inequality, mm -hmm. inequalities in education, in resources, in access, that this has highlighted all of it so much more and that we, we need to do better and we need to take a hard look and be uncomfortable because it's going to be really uncomfortable work for a lot of people and myself included, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and I know that I have work to do too, but, but I think if classical music is to survive again, the next year, 10 years, hundred years, we really have to think about and do the work to yeah, like more, even like just more than virtue signaling, signaling, right? Like more yeah. than than just saying, putting out a post that say Black Lives Matter. Um, it has, it has, we have to do more. It, it is not, yeah. We can't just say, oh, well, we stand in solidarity. Okay, thanks, bye. Here's my season of Mozart and Puccini. Don't we love that? Um, yeah, it just it is like it is. It has to be more than that. Um, and so. I think a change is on its way. Um, I mean, I know, I know that that you are you are thinking about this in your own organizations, and we're definitely thinking about it in our, our organizations, and and just sort of like dismantling and, and rebuilding. Um, uh, and so I hope I hope more organizations follow suit, and I really hope the big the big organizations just get it finally that they get it. Yeah, it's. <sighs> oh, I mean. That's a hard fight. <laughs> hard fight, and you know, seeing, you know, the the Met has rightfully caught a lot of flack recently, and, yeah. and I think they deserve more flack for it. But yeah. sending out a, a Black Lives Matter statement, and then programming Otello the next day with a white singer, um, and there's just it's like. <laughs> But, like, behind this, behind this <laughs> shitty problematic cloak of, like, well, opera is colorblind. Like, no, it's not. It is not colorblind. It is racist. <laughs> the history of the role Otello is racist. <laughs> like, like, point, period. The end. The, the end. end. Oh. And there are so many artists who can do these roles, who succeeded these roles yeah. and deserve to be heard. And, and it's just, there are no more excuses at this point, especially for the Met, other large orchestras, wherever mm -hmm. it's yeah out. yeah especially after they've been like sort of parading like look at all the look at all the black singers we know and have hired in the past oh you mean they did porgy and Bess once once in three years? <laughs> oh okay cool 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 love that i i <laughs> i mean you know i'm hopeful yeah and, um just even in the conversations that i've had with friends and other singers and instrumentalists and even with family that things are really shifting. And I think, um, and I think people are taking a moment to pause. And I think, you know, I don't know that this moment would have been able to happen if we didn't have the pandemic because the job of political activism and protesting and getting out there does not work with a 40 hour work week. And so I think it is because people are out of work and so many of us are still just stuck at home that this is possible. And, um, and I know that these conversations are continuing, but I think that this huge shift between public health and discussions about human rights and mm -hmm. rights for black lives for um just all humans yeah uh, for for native american rights for yeah. latinx communities for the lgbtq community it is like it is all it is all wrapped up in this fight for for black lives matter yeah. you know um and so i think that uh yeah i'm i'm hopeful 
uh, vote, vote, vote. <laughs> Cannot say that enough. Um, yeah, but I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that it changes. It, that we have, we are turning a corner, um, and that the world will be forever changed. Hey, Joe. He so. is the bringer of coffee. <laughs> oh, look at that. What service. <laughs> what service. Service with a smile. <laughs> with a disgruntled... Service with a scowl. Service with, service a, with a scowl. scowl. <laughs> that, is my, that is my man. <laughs> oh, well... Haley, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so so much for taking the time not only to to like throw down Otsitronist, by the way. <laughs> Isn't that like that's the great. harder of the two? <laughs> the she... harder of the two, and that's what people don't know. Uh -huh. The other one has all the fireworks. That's not that's the easy shit. <laughs> So thank you for doing the harder of the two green <laughs> arias. I love it. Um, thank you for taking taking the time um, to talk about about you know what you're up to, but really to still like to take the time to digest what is happening. I think that um, that some some people are like, oh, it's not really my fight. Like, no, it is your fight. It is all of our fight. We all we all have to be united in this. And so I I uh, I appreciate I appreciate your willingness to talk. Thank you. And thank you for having me and for the work that you and Project Link are doing. Uh, I think it's, it's been, you know, again, the pandemic has been shitty, but it's been <laughs> so great to see the ways in which artists have been able to pivot and find ways to collaborate. And I hope that some of this, um, will continue when we actually, you know, when we can actually leave our homes. But yeah. this, oh, let's, because we've been thinking more outside of the box since March than I think a lot of organizations have in 20 years. Ever. So, <laughs> yeah, so I, think, I think, you know, I look for the silver linings in every day and throughout all of this. And, um, so I'm grateful for you and um, the work we're all doing, and we gotta keep keep on fighting. Yeah. Uh, thanks, you, Haley. You're welcome. Have a oh. wonderful day. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>